Notice where the locomotives are. Right now, they're still on Norfolk Southern tracks, track 17 to be specific. Once the locomotives cross over the switch, they will then be on the Reading and Northern's KV branch. I bring this to mind as a segue for an upcoming video series that goes into more detail about how control points, junctions, and interlockings work. For now, most railroad lines in North America are separated by a junction of one sort or another. This is train PISB and it's starting its day working the KV branch. So what exactly are control points, junctions, interlockings, and passing sidings? And how do they work? Let's start with control points. Very simply, on a railroad, control points are points or junctions or interlockings where dispatchers control the signals and switches. Another way of putting it is that wherever the dispatcher or control operator controls the switches, and signals that can be called a control point. It could be one switch at the end of a siding, such as here at CP672, or it could be many switches in a major junction point, such as CP Rockville further down the line in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Normally, all the switches are adjacent and have signals governing the movement over them. If there is enough space between the switches that there is a separate signal governing the movement, then that would be a different control point, such as CP673, one mile to the south. The purpose of a control point is to organize a collection of switches and to name them so that a crew knows where they are and can interface with the dispatcher and, to a certain extent, the CTC machine, if there is one. On a railroad, a junction can be best described as any place two or more tracks converge, diverge, or cross each other. In railway signaling, an interlocking is an arrangement of signals that prevents conflicting movements through an arrangement of tracks such as junctions or crossings. 
The signal appliances and tracks are sometimes collectively referred to as an interlocking plant. An interlocking is designed so that it is impossible to display a signal to proceed unless the route to be used is proven safe. In North America, the official railroad definition of interlocking is an arrangement of signals and signal appliances so interconnected that their movements must succeed each other in proper sequence. Like I said, designed so that it's impossible to display a signal to proceed unless the route to be used is proven safe. Given their traffic density, most railroads should have signals, and fortunately for us, many railroads do. First, the type of signals to be installed must be determined. Automatic block signals, or ABS, are the simplest since these signals only indicate the presence or absence of a train in the blocks ahead and don't necessarily require control by an operator. These are the kind that are mostly used on NS. Interlocking signals may be called for at a junction and can also be an excuse for the always popular interlocking tower if you're modeling a railroad. Most high traffic main lines are now signaled with centralized traffic control or CTC which allows the dispatcher to control the movement of trains with controlled signals at control points or CPs such as here on our Sunbury and River lines. Signal territory is divided into signal blocks with signals at the block boundaries governing entrance to the block. The exact rules vary from railroad to railroad, and ABS, CTC, and interlockings are governed by different rules, but the placement of the block boundaries and the signals is fairly standard.
railroad with a computer-supported CTC system, no two control points can have the same name because that would create a computer code conflict. It wouldn't know which address to send the command to. And it's not a good idea, even without that issue, to have two CPs with the same name anywhere near each other. Certainly not in the same subdivision or in the same dispatching office, as confusion creates risks and risks create wrecks. Railroads now like to use CPs that are numbered based on mileposts, and as a result of mergers, railroads have many lines with the same milepost scheme. According to legend, when railroads like the Southern Pacific had milepost 0.0, .0 at the ferry building in San Francisco, everything further away counted upward, with a few exceptions, so there would be multiple milepost 212 locations. To avoid confusion, an alpha character was added to the milepost to give each line a unique scheme. Thus. For an imaginary scheme on, say, a fictional SP, CPA-212 could be on the Overland route, and B-212 could be on the Shasta route, C-212 on the San Joaquin, and D-212 on the coastline, and so forth like that. A few years back, NS changed the names of the sidings and control points on the then Illinois Division. So instead of East Harristown and West Harristown, you now have Ryder and Harristown. Ryder was the last name of a dispatcher at the time. The man in charge of the signal department got to decide the names, and when he ran out of dispatcher names, he came up with something to his own liking. This man was an avid hunter and gun collector, so several control points are named after guns. NS now has control points like Ruger, Winston, Colt, Browning, etc. Or so the story goes. The CSX Montreal sub was all dark territory and all of the control points and block stations were named, not numbered. Most were somehow related to the specific areas such as Phil for Philadelphia, River for Indian River, Brad for Bradley Street, Rich for Richland, but the rationale for some is less obvious, probably rooted in some former landmark or other significance, or a surveyor. I still haven't figured out roots, and Kane has me scratching my head too. I figure rock has to do with a big rock or maybe a cut. I haven't personally been there to check, but it figures regularly into the form EC-1s. Another point of interest is a couple of control points on the east leg of the Union Pacific Phoenix Line, both in Mesa, Arizona. The first one is called McQueen, and nearby is a road named McQueen, running south from Baseline through Chandler and beyond. Another control point is called Germain, not Germain, and there is a corresponding city road named Germain, and that's Germain with two ends. In both cases, it would appear that the railroad's control points lent their names to the city streets, as none of the roads existed when the railroad was built. And in addition to mileposts, many timetable stations are named for retired or deceased officials to commemorate their dedication and service to the railroad. Well, that's going to do it for part one of control points, junctions, interlockings, and passing sidings, and how they work. We'll be back on part two with more on these and a few other little knickknacks, so stay tuned.